It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Kiewetanong. Um, question to the Premier. Environmental uh, advocacy groups have joined our efforts to uncover information about the backroom deals that have been directing the government's policies. Environmental Defense and Eco Justice filed a Freedom of Information request late last year to, quote, find out what kind of influence developers had on the Ontario Cabinet and the Premier and this Greenbelt decision, unquote. This government, Speaker, unlawfully ignored this request. So the Information and Privacy Commissioner ordered the government to comply with the law, but the government ignored this order again. Question. Now that Environmental Defence and the Eco Justice are suing the, to enforce this order, why is the government breaking the law to avoid disclosing these requested records? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, the government, uh, the department is, uh, is uh, seized with uh, a number of uh, FO freedom of information requests, and uh, we're compiling those and uh, uh, will be prepared to uh, provide them as soon as the department has uh, completed its work. Yeah, I'm going to caution, uh, caution the members on the use of their language. The supplementary question. Uh, Premier, uh, we still don't have the full story. Mr. Speaker, on how the government selected lands for removal from the Greenbelt. The Freedom of Information request is submitted by the uh, uh, Environmental Defence and uh, Eco Justice might fill in some of the remaining gaps. But this Premier is ignoring Freedom of Information law and uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner's orders. He is wasting more public money fighting in court to keep this information secret. What is the Premier trying to hide here? Uh, as, as I just said, Mr. Speaker, uh, just the opposite. Uh, uh, the Department is, uh, is compiling uh, uh, information with respect to a number of uh, Freedom of Information uh, requests, and uh, once they have completed their work, uh, they will provide the information uh, through to the IPC. Sure. The final supplementary. Uh, the Information and Privacy Commissioner, again, had issued multiple orders this year about the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing refusal to comply with the Freedom of Information laws, yeah. including ones related to, to decisions by the Ministry that enriched favoured speculators, including changes to the Greenbelt and the forced expansion of their urban boundaries. On October 13th, the IPC ordered the Ministry to recover records that may have been deleted or destroyed in relation to one of, the, one of these requests. Again, Speaker, will the Premier release all records on the Green Belt graph, or do we have to wait until they come out in the RCMP investigation? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I've said twice, and I will repeat a third time for the, the member, uh, we are seized with a number of uh, freedom of information requests. Uh, the department is. Uh, we are compiling the requested information, and when that is completed, we will transit, uh, transition that uh, information through to the IPC for release. Thank you. The next question, once again, the member for Kiewetanong. Speaker, uh, my question is to, again, to the Premier and I hope he'll take this opportunity to answer. For weeks now, we've been asking questions of this government on what exactly happened over the three days in September when this government did a 180 on their Greenbelt policy. From a rough policy framework on the Greenbelt to specific properties that they identified for removal. The, the Premier told uh, the Integrity Commissioner, he did not recall the meeting. I want to give the Premier one more opportunity to take some responsibility here. Did the Premier have a meeting to discuss the Green Belt on September 15, 2022? <laughs> Governor, 
As I've said on a number of, of occasions in this, in this House, we, we made a public policy decision uh, that we thought uh, would be in the best interest of the people of the province of Ontario. Mainly, it was guided by the desire to build 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario as quickly as possible, recognizing the fact that there are people in this province who, who feel that they may never have the opportunity to own their first home or to rent a place. We also said, Mr. Speaker, that the decisions on the Greenbelt were not ones that were supported by the people of the province of Ontario, and that is why the Premier uh, took the step that he did in, in September uh, to announce that we would be uh, reverting back to the previous policy and that all lands taken out of the green belt would be restored. Uh, I have a bill in front of this house, Mr. Speaker, that is uh, uh, that will soon come again before this house, which transitions those lands back into the green belt, which adds uh, 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 thousands of additional acres to the green belt, but goes a little step further, Mr. In fact, a big step further, Mr. Speaker, by codifying the boundaries of, uh, of the green belt uh, uh, in legislation, Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, uh, I'm going to go through uh, a timeline here because, uh, because it's important. Day one, uh, a dinner with developers where green build packages were exchanged with the minister's chief of staff. Day two, an alleged meeting with the premier, his chief of staff, Mr. Amato and Mr. Clark, Min Mr. Clark, following which Mr. Amato said the premier and his chief of staff were, quote, very serious about Greenbelt swaps. Day three, Mr. Romano informs the ministry that they will be going forward with site-specific removals and identifies three properties accounting for 91 percent of the land this government attempted to remove from the Greenbelt. Two of them were provided at the dinner just days earlier. Back, Question. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. Did the Premier attend the Greenbelt the meeting on the Green Belt on September 15, 2022. Yes. Yeah. Government House Leader. Speaker, I, uh, I trust the, uh, what the Integrity Commissioner wrote when he, uh, uh, when he highlighted the fact uh, that the Premier had uh, uh, no involvement in, public policy, in this particular public policy decision that wasn't supported by the people of the province of Ontario. We've been very clear on that, but make no mistake about it, Mr. Speaker, that we want to build 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario. We think it is a priority. That is why, since 2018, we have introduced a number of bills, in fact, to move us along on that, whether it's transit-oriented uh, uh, communities, whether it's building uh, 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 our transit system faster so that we can get homes around that, Mr. Speaker. The reality is we want to build more homes because it is inappropriate that a full generation of Ontarians should feel that they can't afford a home. A generation of Ontarians should think that they are going to spend the rest of their lives in their parents' basements. I'll let them argue Response. why we think that is proper. We're going to double down, Mr. Speaker. We're going to do everything that we can to remove obstacles, to put more money back in the pockets of the hardworking Ontarians, and to ensure that the dream of home ownership is available to everybody. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, I think a non-answer is an answer in a way. When we asked this question in committee, the government house leader recommended that um, we FOI that information. So we took his advice. So me grudge for that. Thank you for that. In fact, the Premier's calendar has a meeting on September 15, 2022, at 1 p.m. with former Minister Clark, presumably his Chief of Staff and Jamie Wallace. What direction did the Premier give the, his Minister and staff regarding the Green Belt? I don't even know where to begin with that. Shocking. A, a premier would speak with a cabinet minister <laughs> on policy issues, Mr. Speaker. The overriding policy of this government since day one has been to build more homes across the province of Ontario. You know why, Mr. Speaker? Because under the policies, I, in fact, I wish that the previous premier, uh, the Liberal premier, didn't speak as often with the NDP, because had they not spoken as often, then we might have had more shovels in the ground. But since day one, we have been focused on building more homes, removing obstacles, building more transit and transportation, improving our school, uh, our school system, building more long-term care. So when the premier speaks to his cabinet and his caucus colleagues across the province of Ontario, it is about moving the province forward. The NDP have figured out how to do an FOI. Congratulations to you. Good job.
The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Speaker, through you to the Premier. Last year, the City of Hamilton proposed an official plan that would focus development within its urban boundaries, growing up instead of out. But the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing ignored the people of Hamilton, and on the same day he announced the Greenbelt grab, he also announced a massive expansion of Hamilton's urban boundaries. The first developers to take advantage, included those we know now, received preferential treatment with the Greenbelt grab. This morning, the minister announced a sudden reversal of that decision. Did the former minister give preferential treatment to favoured insiders when he approved Hamilton's urban boundary expansion, yes or no? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Mr. Speaker, when I was uh, appointed to the job, uh, I wanted to ensure that I reviewed everything that had been done on the focus of ensuring that uh, the utmost in, in, in accountability. Uh, when I reviewed uh, the urban boundary expansions and the official plans that uh, had been uh, previously uh, uh, approved, I wasn't satisfied that it met uh, the test uh, of accountability that uh, uh, that I have. Uh, uh, that I think brings public trust along with it. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I am completely focused, as are my, my municipal partners, uh, as our home builders, in, in ensuring that we reach that 1.5 million target for the people of the province of Ontario. So we're making a decision to work more closely with our, uh, our partners. I, I have to give a lot of credit uh, to Mayor Sutcliffe uh, when I went to speak with him. Uh, he said, look, work with us, work with us, uh, start a new relationship with us because we're on the same page. We want Fonts. to build more homes. We can do this with you. Uh, so I thank uh, Mayor Sutcliffe for his work. That is why we reversed some of those decisions. But make no mistake, we're going to move forward and we're going to get the job done. Supplementary question. Through you again to the Premier, Speaker, an internal ministry document submitted in court and obtained by the Narwhal and the Hamilton Spectator shows that the former minister had no legitimate basis for expanding Hamilton's urban boundaries the way he did. However, the former minister's decision enriched favoured speculators just as his Greenbelt decision did. Despite this, despite this morning's announcement, the people of Ontario still have questions. To the Premier, will this government give us some answers, or should the RCMP be investigating Hamilton's urban boundary expansions as well? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. The answer is this, Mr. Speaker. We want to work more closely and better with our municipal partners so that we can do the thing that matters most to the people of the province of Ontario, and that is build more homes so that everybody can uh, have the dream of home ownership, Mr. Speaker. I'm not prepared as Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing uh, to, uh, uh, to live by decisions that won't allow us to meet that goal for the next generation. I worked uh, very closely uh, with my municipal partners at this point, and they have said, they have said look, uh, give us the opportunity uh, to, uh, to suggest things that allow us to meet that goal. So that is why we are accepting uh, those municipal uh, official plans as submitted. And over the next 45 days, we will take additional recommendations from our municipal partners in these areas so that they can identify areas where we could actually build even more housing, Mr. Speaker. But we'll be guided by the requests from uh, our, uh, our municipal partners on this. And I'm, I'm very excited by the Let's... opportunity to work more closely with them, with home builders, and with the broader community to ensure that we uh, achieve this goal. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Every day, thousands of people use Highway 401 to travel across the GTA and beyond. I hear from the people and businesses in my riding from Mississauga and Mills that they are tired of being stuck in traffic. They are frustrated with endless gridlock that is causing delays and disruptions that negatively impact their productivity and quality of life. That's why our government must urgently invest in new road infrastructure that will help keep goods and people moving. Speaker, can the minister please provide an update on how our government it's expanding the highway network in Mississauga. To respond, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for his tireless advocacy for the people of Mississauga. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, after decades of inaction under the leadership of Premier Ford, we're finally building the infrastructure that we need for our future. Speaker, we're building new highways, roads, bridges across the entire province, including the great city of Mississauga. In our 2023 budget, we announced that our government is committing to $27.9 billion over the next 10 years to connect communities, 
fight gridlock, and keep goods moving. I am pleased to share that our government has completed construction on the widening of Highway 401 between Mississauga and Milton. This provides an additional 18 kilometres of new Spons. lanes. Drivers will spend less time in traffic and more time with family. Speaker, we're building Ontario for generations to come. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the minister. Widening Highway 401 is an excellent step forward in our government's plan to build a stronger Ontario. Our government, our province need more transportation infrastructure to help support our growing population, connect communities, and improve economic productivity. Unfortunately, these facts are something that the NDP and Liberals don't seem to understand. They say no to building vital transportation projects that will help to reduce gridlock and improve our quality of life. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians deserve better from their elected officials. Can the minister please explain how investments by our government into roads and highways will help to build up Ontario? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gridlock has a real cost. When our trucks are stuck in traffic, it only makes the cost of goods more expensive. Gridlock already costs the economy $11 billion per year, and it will only get worse if we don't build more. That's why, unlike the Liberals and the NDP, we won't sit by as gridlock gets worse. In the last election, the people of Ontario voted overwhelmingly for our government to continue building highways. Mr. Speaker, because we're not afraid to do the right thing. That's why we're committed to investing in Highway 413 and building the Bradford Bypass. We're going to keep our economy moving and build the infrastructure we need to support Response. Ontario's growing population. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. I am very concerned about this government's plan to further privatize home and community care services. In Thunder Bay and across the province, we have seen the devastating consequences of turning over critical services to private corporations. Missed appointments, staffing shortages, and ultimately worse outcomes for Ontarians. To the Premier, will you ensure there is publicly available home and community care for all Ontarians. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. What our government will ensure is an expansion of home and community care for a billion dollar investment. We are stabilizing home and community care because we understand how critically important it is for people to be able to access care close to home and yes, sometimes in home. And that investment of a billion dollars is going to ensure that we have a stabilized home and community care system that includes lots of partners, including uh, organizations like Meals on Wheels, to make sure that we are able to support and provide care for people close to home and in home. Speaker. When private, for-profit companies are involved in essential services, they don't suddenly change their business models. That's right. Up to 30% of every taxpayer dollar that could be going into care is instead going into shareholder profits. Shame. 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 To the Premier, will you listen to home and community care workers and clients and stop the privatization of essential services for seniors and people with disabilities? Here, here. Minister of Health. We have listened and we will continue to listen. This is something that the home and community care system have been asking for for years. We are finally acting to make sure that no matter where you live in the province of Ontario, there is going to be a consistent approach, a consistent uh, opportunity for individuals to be able to be served in community. What does that mean? It means that Mrs. Brown, when she is recovering from hospital, can go home, get the physio support she needs in home get the support she needs to be able to, to continue on her treatment path and do it in a safe 
and frankly, exactly what they want. We need people to be able to be able to have those treatment options in home, in community. Individuals want that opportunity to be able to be with their loved ones in community. And a billion dollar Response. investment means we can action that, something that the, the system has been asking for for literally decades. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Speaker, parents in Ontario need certainty. They need certainty that their children will be in school, learning the foundations of reading, writing and math, uninterrupted by the threat of strikes. And I, like many parents, was disappointed to hear that some teacher unions have rejected our plan to keep students in schools by way of interest arbitration. Instead, some teachers' unions have chosen a strike mandate that has left Ontario parents in a state of uncertainty and threatens their children with disruptions to their education. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is standing up for our students and working to keep our students in class? Thank you. Great class. And to reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Brantford, Brant, for his question, his leadership, his commitment to keeping kids in class in this province. Uh, Speaker, it's disheartening that some of the unions have rejected this opportunity, a deal that ensures stability for their members and for all kids. I mean, Mr. Speaker, a Leger poll came out last week when seven in ten Ontarians agree with binding arbitration, but not one new Democrat has the courage to urge the union to sign this deal, get on with it, so we can keep kids in class. Mr. Speaker, this government and our Premier is unequivocally clear on our mandate. Keep kids in class, back to basics in classroom. Stand up for the rights of children to learn. Mr. Speaker, 400,000 high school students now have that stability because we signed a deal with OSSTF. We're going to keep working hard. We're going to urge the union to get to the table, get a deal, provide predictability, and help ensure kids stay in class in this province, Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. All children are best served by remaining in their classrooms, learning the knowledge and skills that they need to succeed. Speaker, the people of Ontario clearly expect that our students must continue their school year without disruption. Nothing should matter more than students being in class and benefiting from uninterrupted learning over the next years, with an enhanced focus on reading, writing and math. Students across our province deserve to complete their school year uninterrupted especially after the last few years of uncertainty. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is ensuring that students have the support they need for a school year free from any disruption? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, it is important that we get back to basics in Ontario uh, schools. It's important these kids stay in school as a basic principle, which clearly only progressive Conservatives accept. Um, Mr. Speaker, when we brought forth a budget that increased funding for this school year by $670 million, New Democrats and Liberals opposed it. When we increased math supports and literacy supports and hired 2,000 teachers, New Democrats and Liberals opposed it. When we increased mental health funding Order. by 550 per cent, New Democrats and Liberals opposed it. It. They have opposed progress in this province when it comes to enriching the lives of students, of ensuring accountability on school boards, and parents know they can depend on this Premier to stand up for children for better quality education and for the right to learn in this province, Speaker. And the next question, the member for Parkdale, High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. People across Ontario are being asked to pay $650 million to subsidize a private luxury spa at Ontario Place. There are questions about the fairness and integrity of the procurement that gave Therma control Order. of public land for 95 years. These questions remain unanswered. The Ontario Place call for development said very clearly that bidders Order. needed to work with the existing parking and that government would not pay for additional facilities. Why was Therma preferentially offered a publicly funded parking garage when other bidders were specifically told to use existing parking? And to apply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, honestly, I cannot believe that I'm answering this question again. Every single tourist destination has parking. 
why to make it as accessible for people as possible. What a shocking Twitter. Twitter. What a shocking circumstance that we're creating a world-class destination with attractions and things for families to do and government considers parking. Of course government would consider parking. Every single other tourist attraction offers parking so that the mom from Scarborough with three kids can get down and enjoy Ontario Place. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. We know this government had been secretly planning a publicly funded parking garage for Therma nearly two years before Order. the public found out. The call for development Order. said very clearly that bids requiring additionally publicly funded facilities would not be considered. If Therma's bid required a government funded parking garage, it should have been rejected. Yep. Last week, we asked whether Therma's bid required a publicly funded parking garage, and the minister refused to answer. Answer. So I'll ask again. Did Thermos bid require a publicly funded parking garage? Yes or no? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, I'm more than happy to speak about Therma. Also, uh, also was a leading contender in a procurement that took place in 2018 when we weren't even government. Mr. Speaker, we're Perhaps the member that's opposite to me would like to speak about that in this House. But, Mr. Speaker, what we are achieving Order. here. Order. Mr. Speaker, what we hope to achieve here, of course, is to create a wonderful site the families can enjoy with a brand new science centre, with more exhibition space, with a wellness and water park facility, with 50 acres of public realm space, and a brand new Budweiser stage. If that doesn't require parking, like honest to God, what does? Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Yeah, My question is for the Premier. Speaker, does the Premier believe that Ontario taxpayers should pay for his lawyer in the RCMP's criminal investigation of the $8.3 billion deal, yes or no? Yeah. The government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, of course, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll follow uh, all government guidelines when it comes to that, Mr. Speaker. The member knows that. Uh, uh, I uh, will actually could probably seek advice from the member since uh, the Premier that he worked for was under investigation for the balance of his time in office, Mr. Speaker. But here's the reality. What we're going to do is, despite the uh, musings of the member from Ottawa and the opposition, we're going to continue to focus on what matters to the people of the province of Ontario, and that is building more homes for people, that is putting more money back in their pocket, that is reversing some of the difficult decisions that have been foisted on Ontarians by his cousins in Ottawa, which has led to higher taxes, which has led to a carbon tax, which ultimately has led to high inflation and out-of-control interest rates. I note that the Premier again has led the nation today, calling on the Bank of Canada by writing to the Premier to say, keep interest rates down. That is what we're focused on, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to get the Response. job done because 700,000 people who have the dignity of a job today that didn't when they were in office are depending on us to do even more, and we will. Here, here. A supplementary question. I thought it was a fairly simple question and simple answer, but apparently not. So, Speaker, I saw the government's response that said its long-standing practice was to pay cover legal fees for politicians and political staff. Well, that might be the case in civil litigation. But this, the difference about this is this is a criminal investigation, a criminal investigation by the RCMP, a criminal investigation into this government's attempt to give an $8.3 billion advantage to wealthy, well-connected insiders, and by his own admission, the Premier's friends and fundraisers. The legal costs for politicians and staff caught up in the RCMP's criminal investigation of the $8.3 billion backroom deal should be paid for by the individual or the Ontario PC, PC party. Does the Premier agree, yes or no? Government House Leader. 
Speaker, I've, al I've already answered the, the question, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we're going to continue to do what is important to the people of the province of Ontario, focus on things really that, uh, that, as a result of the inability of the opposition, the Liberals in particular, over 15 years to accomplish anything. You know, it's hard to imagine, but they left us, the Liberals left us the most indebted, most highly regulated, highest tax jurisdiction, literally in Canada, if not the world, and what do we have to show for it? Literally nothing. Nothing. They weren't able to get transit built, so we had to do it. Our hospitals were left crumbling, so we're fixing them. They built no long-term care homes, so we're building them, Mr. Speaker. Our students were left in, in, in disadvantage in, in comparison to every other jurisdiction, and now finally we're starting to see, because Response. of the work of this minister, improvements in, in, uh, in our education system, Mr. Speaker. We've reduced red tape to the tune of billions of dollars, eight billion dollars back into the pockets of our small, medium, and large job creators, and 700,000 people who have a job. Thank you. The next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. The skilled trades are important to Ontario's economy and our everyday lives. Skilled trade workers are the ones who build our homes, keep the lights on and help to move <clears throat> our province forward. The demand for skilled tradespeople continues to grow. That's why our government must continue to demonstrate leadership in attracting more people towards these fulfilling and good-paying careers. The reality is that we need, we need to be doing more to help get people into the skilled trades. We need to have the best workforce in the world in order to keep attracting investments to build a stronger Ontario. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to support Ontarians to enter the skilled trades sector? Thank you. The Minister of Labour, Immigration. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you very much to that member for that important question. Uh, Speaker, we're taking the challenge of unlocking the lost potential under the previous Liberal uh, NDP coalition of actually getting people into the trades, uh, supporting <laughs> Speaker, they're laughing, but wait till I get to the stats. Um, getting people into the skilled trades, the 300,000 jobs that go unfilled every year. That's why we created Skilled Trades Ontario, a new Crown agency, which has a mandate to streamline registration and certification in Ontario's 144 skilled trades, breaking down the stigma and getting more people in. And that's just one of the many changes we've taken on as a government. And the stats are, speak for themselves, Speaker. We've seen a 25% increase in apprenticeship registration this year over last, and a 30% increase in women in the skilled trades. And wait till we get into the specifics Response. in the supplementary, Speaker. It's working to build a stronger Ontario. We need the men and women in the trades to get the job done, and we're doing just that. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to hear that our government is taking the necessary steps to build up our skilled trade system. Mr. Speaker, our province is experiencing a generational labour shortage. It is a fact that nearly 300,000 jobs are going unfilled across our province, including in my riding of Carleton. By 2025, one in five job openings in Ontario will be in the skilled trades industry alone. That's why our government must continue demonstrating leadership and implement an all-of-government approach to address this ongoing labour shortage. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is attracting more Ontarians into careers in the skilled trades? Thank you. Mr. Labour. Thank you, Speaker. And that member's right. I'm glad she highlighted uh, the labour shortage. You know, when the previous government failed to build schools, in fact, they closed them in rural Ontario, when they failed to build public transit and failed to build hospitals, it wasn't just that they failed to make those commitments. They did nothing to address the labour shortages that we'll need to actually build them. But thanks to the leadership of this Premier, we're getting the job done, building hospitals, building schools, building public transit. And we recognize the need for the talent pipeline to ensure young men and women enter the trades, uh, Speaker, and that's why uh, we've made that investment in Skilled Trades Ontario. We're also investing $224 million to help through the Skills Development Fund Capital Stream. That's helping build training centres for apprentices and tradespeople uh, through that fund. This is just one part of our $1.5 billion dollar commitment uh, to the skilled trades to addressing the backlog, the neglect by the Response. previous Liberal government, so that people can find a job in the skilled trades, because we know that when you have a job in the trades, you've got a career for life, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary member for the Stephen Mr. President, 
My question is to the Premier. Thank you, Speaker. I represent the voices of families in my riding. The, fa uh, the Ferris family from Constance Lake First Nation had to go through a preventable tragedy overlooked by this government. On July 26, their family member passed an awful, in an awful circumstance when Orange Transfer failed to be efficient enough to bring Mrs. Ferris to the hospital to get vital treatment. Orange Protocol had been upgraded, haven't been upgraded for decades, and there is a well-documented shortage of staffing. My question. Considering Orange performance, approximately 20,000 air ambulance service uh, or medical flights per year and is fully part of the Ontario health care system, will it take another coroner report to increase government oversight in Orange operations? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the member opposite would know that I cannot speak to individual circumstances without the family's approval. It would not be appropriate. Having said that, the investments that we are making with and for Orange have meant that a world-class service that we should be incredibly proud of here in Ontario, the ability for Orange to be able to move around pediatric patients, adults and individuals who have to get out of uh, remote and rural areas and access our world-class health care, have the support of our government to do that work. Thank you. Supplementary question. People are dying. People are not getting their service up north. You need to get up north and look what's happening. On September 28th, Order. William Luther received diagnosis in Kingston and decided that he had wanted to return home in Moose Factory as soon as possible after having been flown by Orange. October 3rd, Orange informed him he would be transported from but was forced to stop in Moosonee. Two days later, he was told by Orange upon arrival that his transport would not occur before 7 p.m. due to staffing issues with the Orange or, uh, local Orange base. William Lutit then had, even with severe mobility issues, to take a boat taxi himself from Moussigny to Moose Factory without Orange. Ma question, again to the Premier, will it take another coroner's report to increase government oversight in Orange operation and protocol before more preventable tragedies continue question. to happen? Mr. Hall. Thank you, Speaker. While the member opposite will insert himself into clinical decisions, I will not. Having said that, I have and often communicate with and meet with Air Orange paramedics who are truly world-class. One of the reasons that we have invested in a Learn and Stay program that includes paramedics in Northern Ontario is exactly because we have a plan and it is working. We now have more paramedics being trained in Northern Ontario who will then, in exchange for tuition and books being covered by the province of Ontario, practice in those, serv those areas that need a higher level of service. We will make the investments. The member opposite and their party will continue to vote against those investments, but we're getting the job done. Here, Thank here. you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> My Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Ontario is facing a generational labour shortage, particularly in the skilled trades. This is having a profound effect and impact on our economy, as this is resulting in a supply chain challenge and higher prices for services. In order for Ontario to remain a world-class leader, our government must ensure that we are making the right investments when it comes to post-secondary education. By strengthening our skilled trades and apprenticeships, education systems, we can provide all Ontarians with the tools they need in order to be prepared for the jobs of tomorrow. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to expand post-secondary educational opportunities in the skilled trade sector? To reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for asking such an important question. Our government recognizes that addressing labour shortages head-on starts with post-secondary education. That is why we continue to support and promote our Ontario College's skilled trades and apprenticeship programs across the province to further enhance opportunities for college students to enter the workforce with job-ready skills. Our government expanded the degrees that colleges can offer to now include new three-year degrees and more four-year degrees. Our government also invested over $60 million in funding to support Ontario's first micro-credential strategy 
and made them OSAP eligible to help workers from all backgrounds upgrade their skills. And all these measures were unsupported by the Liberals and NDP. As Ontario faces a growing labour shortage in the skilled trades, we are making the necessary adjustments for students to enter skilled trade programs. Because, Speaker, when you have a job in the trade, you have a job for life. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the, minister, uh, the Minister's response and for her dedicated work and advocacy for a positive university and college environment. Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm encouraged by the actions of our government and what we've done to help more young uh, people start careers in the skilled trades. And That said, uh, Speaker, we must recognize that opportunities to pursue a career in this field have not always been equal. In uh, 2021, women represented less than 4% of the workers in automotive and construction skilled trades. This has to change. Uh, in order for our government to address the ongoing labour shortages in Ontario, we must create better working conditions for women to enter and succeed in the trades. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is empowering educational institutions to help more women pursue rewarding careers in the skilled trades? The Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And our government recognizes the vital role that women have in building a stronger Ontario. When we have more women in the skilled trades, we are not just strengthening the success of businesses, but also empowering women while bolstering economic prosperity in Ontario. Speaker, that's why events like Jill of All Trades, hosted at Centennial College, are so important. I'm excited to be attending this event tomorrow for the second year in a row with my colleagues. These events provide opportunities for high school girls to experience rewarding career options in the trades and teaches them that the skilled trades are a promising option for them. Speaker, it's projected that one in five new job openings in Ontario are likely to be in skilled trade sector by 2025. That is why I am proud that our government is giving women and all students the flexible access they need to pursue innovative training that leads to rewarding careers. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Pride Toronto released their 2023 economic impact report this morning. I had the pleasure of putting it on, a copy on every member's desk at their request. Pride Toronto has generated $600 million in economic activity for Ontario, creating almost 7,000 jobs. Very impressive. But because of rise of hate incidents, insurance and security costs have now doubled. This government has cut Pride Toronto's funding and it is now sitting at 50 per cent less than where it was in 2019. This is happening at a time as we're entering into a recession. During the time, Ontarians are now seeing rising hate everywhere. Pride festivals matter more than ever before. I want to thank the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports for recently meeting Pride Toronto, but I understand that no commitments were made regarding funding. So the Premier is here today. I'd like to ask the Premier directly, will his government commit to increase permanent sustainable funding for Pride Festivals across Ontario? Thank you. Member for Brampton North and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, as we know, Ontario's strength is in our diversity and inclusivity. We're home to a strong and vibrant LGBT plus community whose experiences and contributions have and continue to make our province a stronger and better place. Our government believes that all Ontarians should be able to fully and freely express who they are and love whoever they want. As one of the world's largest Pride Festivals, the Government of Ontario is proud to support Pride Toronto each year since 2018. We provided close to $1.5 million in grants to support the work they do to celebrate Toronto's LGBT plus community. But I would ask the member, that when we support the LGBT community, uh, plus community, we also support all the members, including police officers who are uh, members of the community as well. I hope that the member will speak to uh, Pride Toronto and involve uh, police officers uh, in next year's Toronto Pride Parade. Thank you. A supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Under this government, we've seen a, a chronic underfunding of Pride festivals. This has now become an Ontario-wide problem. Gray Bruce Pride informs me that their local police service recently told them, and it's shocking, that they cannot guarantee their safety, despite the fact that they've seen increase of threats and violent protests. So speaking about safety, Speaker, I'm very interested in knowing why this government has not been able to develop an anti-2SLGBTQ hate, hate crime strategy thus far. 
windows are being broken, hateful graffiti sprayed on schools, pride flags torn down and burned, queer and trans families are being threatened and bullied, and yet we are seeing no action from this government. Speaker, how much longer do two-spirited queer and trans Ontarians have to wait before their matter, their safety matters to this government? Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And I'll, men I'll mention as well that the minister has met with Pride Toronto several times, uh, and Speaker, our government respects and supports members of, uh, of Ontario's LGBT plus community. Uh, we have worked closely, uh, the minister and myself, we've met, uh, worked closely with community organizations. Actually, these discussions that we've had helped inspire the redesigned Anti-Hate Security Prevention Grant, which includes now Pride and Community and other LGBT plus organizations. I'll note that that's a $25.5 million investment that the member voted against. And when we talk about what that means, colleagues, when uh, an LGBT plus organization like Loud North Bay, who's here with us today, invest in better windows or uh, security cameras, that member voted against it. When we invest in measures to keep members of the LGBT plus community safe in Toronto or Brampton or Response. other parts of Ontario, that member voted against it. So I think the member should look a little closer to home uh, and stand up for the LGBT plus community in all communities that are victims of hate crimes. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Last weekend, I had the tremendous opportunity to visit the Seniors Active Living Fair in Windsor. Uh, the event was hosted by the Older Adult Centre of Ontario Association in conjunction with the Nigerian Canadians for cultural, educational and economic progress. It was a great time and I was greatly impressed by the breadth of information provided to those who attended. Uh, we often hear the Minister speak about the importance of connecting seniors to programs right in their communities, like mine, so that they can remain independent and active. Events such as these are vital in supporting the health and well-being of our seniors. This is why our government must remain focused on advocating for seniors. Speaker, can the minister please explain Question. how our government is raising awareness about programs and services that are available to seniors in Ontario? Great question. Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you for that excellent question. The member for Windsor Tecumseh is doing a marvelous job advocating for not only the seniors but all the residents in his writing. Speaker, these fairs are incredible ways for our government to partner with the Older Adults Centre of Ontario Association. The AOCA brings together these local seniors events. And these seniors events are ways for our seniors to come together to learn about the programs and services that are available close to home. I've been to a number of these fairs and the seniors are so happy to be with other seniors. Thank you. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and truly thank you to the Minister for his response. Uh, it's great to see how Seniors Active Living Fairs are helping Ontario's seniors to feel more connected to their communities. Uh, speaker, the risk of social isolation for seniors is truly a reality. Research studies have documented the detrimental effects that social isolation can have on the physical and mental health of seniors. With the winter months approaching, it is even more important for seniors to have access to activities and programs where they can remain healthy, active, and socially connected. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting the quality of life for seniors in Ontario? Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you again for that very important question. Speaker, not only does the OACAO provide senior fairs, they also have 299 senior active living centers funded in partnership with our government. 
these centers are a great way for seniors to stay fit, active, and healthy during colder months. With a wide variety of activities from mahjong, arts, crafts, and pickleball, and fitness classes, they have it all. I encourage all seniors to visit center this winter and enjoy some fun activities with your friends. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, 60 students are about to graduate from Conestoga College in Kitchener, ready to become licensed electricians. But they can't start. <laughs> but wait for it. They can't start working because of long delays in writing their CFQ exams through the Ministry of Labour. In London, I heard from a carpenter who has an employer but is facing up to seven years to get Red Seal certification because he can't get into the classroom. Speaker, Ontario needs skilled trade workers if we are to get desperately needed housing built in this province. What? The member for London West has the floor, and I need to be able to hear her question. And she's not that far away from me. Thank you. I apologize to the member for London West. She has the floor. Start the call. Speaker, why did this government do such little preparation to make sure that skilled trade workers in Kitchener and London and across this province can get certified? The Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Speaker, there you have it. For the first time since I was elected in 2018, I heard it. The NDP finally recognized what we've known since 2018. We need men and women in the skilled trades in Ontario. So I thank that member for the question, and I will be happy to connect with that member offline on specific challenges. But I'm happy to say that skilled trades registration has been up 30 percent this year over last. Our skills development fund, under the leadership of this premier, we're getting men and women into the trades like Phil, who I met up in Thunder Bay. It's changed his life. Changed his life. And we're not just doing it at union halls, we're doing it through the youth apprenticeship training. Skilled trades for men and women in, in OEAP programs, youth Lots. skilled trades people of tomorrow is up. Indigenous youth is up, but it's up against a sobering stat. The NDP and the opposition did nothing for youth through OEAP. The fund didn't even exist. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I don't hear the rhetoric about skilled trades. We all know that it's important to have skilled trade workers. Here's the situation, Speaker. Questions to the Premier. Electrical students at Conestoga College are desperate to write their CFQ. That means they'll become electricians. But they can't, Speaker. They can't because Conestoga College doesn't have any testing days. They have reached out to the Ministry of Labour, the Minister's portfolio, to add at least one more testing day, at least one, to the regional office. One more day means that these 30 Kitchener students can start working Order. as qualified journey persons as quickly as possible. As quickly as possible. Your minister, your ministry, sorry, told them that you don't have enough staff. Order. That you don't have enough staff. For a government that claims to be working for workers, it doesn't seem like they are, Speaker, because everyone knows Ontario desperately needs tradespeople. So why is the Conservative government Question. not prepared for these tradespeople to take their final certification tests? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Well, it's lost on nobody that that member voted against the Mining Act. That member has no credibility in this place. When it comes to unlocking the potential of the next gen in skilled trades, he shuts down every opportunity. We need the critical minerals to support the incredible billions of dollars in automotive investments. He voted against it. He voted against a better future for the men and women in his own community. He's got zero credibility when it comes to the skilled trades. But, Speaker, but, Speaker, 
Those young people who want a better future in the skilled trades Order. know that this government will keep making those investments, supporting men and women in the trades, whether it be in a union hall, whether it be in a college, or whether it be in Order. one of the new training centres we're building Response. thanks to this Premier. We've got their back, Speaker. That members all talk, no action. Stop the call. Order. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Many people living in my riding of Whitby and across the GTA rely on public transit as their primary form of travel. Their experience in using public transit should be convenient and efficient across the entire transit network. However, as the TTC works with other local transit authorities, including the GO Transit, the fare system under different transit agencies is inconsistent. This leads speaker to confusion and dissatisfaction. My constituents have been asking for a simpler way to pay their transit fare, and it's up to our government to come up with workable and common sense solutions. Can the minister please explain how our government is making it easier and more convenient to take transit across the greater Toronto area? Great question. And to respond, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you once again to my colleague uh, from uh, Whitby for his tireless advocacy for his community and transit. Under the leadership of our Premier, our government continues to build on our commitment to improving transit experience for all Ontarians. We're making it easier to take transit by giving riders more ways to pay. After launching payment by credit and debit card as a pilot on the UP Express, we extended the option to pay by credit card through smartphones or smartwatches to the entire GO Network Transit, a uh, GO Transit network as well. Communities like Brampton, Mississauga, and the Oakville transit systems. We are further expanding new payment options to more transit agencies across the GTA, including payment by debit. Mr. Speaker, we Mr. are aligning our Presto system with leading transit practices from jurisdictions across the world. This is how our government will continue delivering a A supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister. It's great to see how our government is providing transit riders with more choices that make it easier to travel. However, it's essential that our government continues to remove barriers to ridership and make life more affordable. Life is already expensive for the hardworking individuals and families across our great province. For many of them, Transit fares add on to the financial burdens that they're already experiencing. The previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, failed the people of Ontario when it came to addressing important transit issues. Speaker, the people of Ontario deserve better. Can the minister please explain how our government is offering Ontarians cost-effective ways to travel? Great question. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is absolutely right. Our government has prioritized affordability by putting more money back into the pockets of transit riders. In contrast to the previous Liberal government, with its transit hikes for six straight years, our government has provided a reimbursement for applicable GO Transit riders. We have also eliminated double fares for many GO Train riders in the GTA. For youth aged 13 to 19, we have expanded their Presto fare card discounts. Speakers, unlike the Liberals and the NDP, our government is making transit more affordable and accessible for every rider across this province. Response. That's why we have also made a record and historic investment 
$70 billion over the next 10 years. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to fill Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Human resources crisis, whether we look at emergency room closure, at the 2.2 million Ontarians who don't have access to primary care, at the long wait list for surgery, does the minister believe that agency nursing are part of the solutions to Ontario health human resources crisis? Good health. Speaker, I'm not sure if the member opposite has read the uh, news article that says Ontario had the highest percentage of people with a regular health care provider at 90.6 percent, suggesting better health care accessibility. That, of course, came out of Health Matrix today. We can do more, and we are doing more. You know, whether it is directing the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and the College of Nurses of Ontario to quickly expedite review and ultimately license nurses who, and doctors who are internationally trained and want to practice in the province of Ontario, whether, of course, it is expanding the number of residency positions that are available in every single Ontario um, health care system schooling. We have made those investments. Response. We continue to make those investments. We have a plan and it is working, and I wish the member opposite would share some of that with her colleagues so that when these investments come forward in fall economic statements or budgets, you actually support those investments. Supplementary question. Let me tell you, Speaker, about what nursing agencies do to our health care system. They have exploded in every part of Ontario. In order to have quality care, you need continuity of care. With agency nursing, there is no continuity. They affect quality. They poach healthcare uh, professional from our hospital, from our healthcare system, to go work into agency nursing. They charge up to $300 an hour, plus signing bonuses, for a nurse who will get not even a third of that, who usually makes. 39 bucks an hour. What is this government doing about the multiple problems created throughout our health care system directly linked to agency nursing? Minister of Health. You know, respectfully, Speaker, facts matter in this discussion, and the use of uh, health personnel, agency nursing, has actually decreased in the province of Ontario. We are seeing individuals who want to practice, who want to train, who want to work in the province of Ontario, continuously adding to our health human resources, whether it's in, uh, in our, our education through our colleges and universities, or a higher percentage of individuals internationally trained who are actually practicing in the province of Ontario. You know, I have no intention of removing a tool that has been a very important tool for hospitals, for long-term care, for home and community care, to make sure that they have the staff that they need to appropriately serve the people of Ontario. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have with us in the uh, chamber today a former member of the legislature who served the riding of Hamilton East Stony Creek in the 39th, 40th, 41st, 42nd, and 40, 43rd provincial parliament, Paul Miller. Great to have you here. Education has a point of order. Sure, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, just midway through uh, question period, my uncle Frank and his amazing partner Virginia have joined us here from BC. My uncle is a wonderful language instructor and an actor, and I want to welcome you to the worst theatre in the city of Toronto. <laughs> Not a point of order, but we welcome you nonetheless. Next, we have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on Government Order Number 39 relating to the censure of the member for Hamilton Centre. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bill.